and welcome. How are you guys doing? Ooh, it's the last, well, it's not the last session. There's one more session after this, but it's like the closing thing. So welcome to my talk. It is Infrastructure as Code, and we're going to talk about some of the different tools you use to create stuff in the cloud. So how are you guys doing today? Pretty good conference? Did you get ice cream? That's the important thing, right? So anyway, uh, what are we going to do today? What do you want to get out of today? Terraform and Pulumi. So you want to see deep dive into both, or like a flyover of both? You want to see us deep dive into Pulumi. Arm and bicep is of no interest. OK. This is going to be fun, <laughs> especially since uh, the talk does talk about arm. Does anyone want to see arm or bicep? OK. About half the room. How many people want to see Terraform? OK. And Pulumi then, about an equal amount. Wow. OK. Well, that's good to know, because when we talk about the different options that we've got for this, um, there's a lot of things that we can do. And it feels like the sun's right there, so maybe, yeah, just shifting a little bit over. Um, my name's Mike Bankovich. I'm a former, used to be what Microsoft called a developer evangelist. Um, I worked there from 2004 to 2012. Um, I remember when Scott Guthrie got promoted to be a vice president. I mean, like here, Scott Hansman's like, yeah, look at this. And it's like, okay, wow. It's a, it's a full thing in the conference. Um, but I left Microsoft about 10 years ago, and I've been doing consulting. I've been helping people understand how to take advantage of this cloud thing. Um, I was one of the founders, one of the original authors of a thing called Azure Boot Camp, uh, which was a series of events that we used to do. It was a two-day deep dive into Azure, and you would do hands-on labs and a lot of stuff like that. Um, we would use all 12 of the, uh, func of the services that were in Azure back then. Um, since then, I've been trying to keep that tour de jour alive, and this is sort of a part of it. And I've got a, a course on LinkedIn Learning that goes a little bit deeper into ARM and the uh, BICEP side of things, infrastructure as code, um, but it's a little bit old. I'm going to be updating that course over the next six months, and so I'm working with LinkedIn on that. Um, but if you're interested in other things, you can go out to my website, which is bencotips.com. And on the left-hand side, you can see um, some, of the, some of the other courses that I've got out here, just on different things like uh, YAML, pipelines, permit to cloud, data options, uh, serverless and IoT, if you're doing like serverless and data streaming, looking at how messaging works. A um, lot of different types of things that I, that I will tend to cover. Um, but most importantly is near the top, if you have questions or if we get to a point where you want to know more after the talk is done, you're like, hey, wait a second, you said this, but I found that. I want to talk to you or call you out on it or whatever. Feel free to do that. My email's on here, mike at benko.com. Send me an email. Um, I, I try to respond to that. Uh, Azure Office Hours, I do that on Fridays. Um, but on LinkedIn, which is this link on the slide right here, um, connect up with me and say we were you know, just where we were here at, uh, in Copenhagen and we were at this talk. And I answer uh, the LinkedIn messages really pretty religiously. I mean, it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's real close to how to um, stay in touch. So I'm a developer. I'm a programmer. You know, I go out and I build things. I make the world a better place. Would you say you're a developer? How many people would say you're probably not a developer? More, what, what would you say? Uh, cloud solution architect. Cloud solution architect. Which architect is like developer that's been developer f developing for a long time, draws boxes, connects things together, but also knows the right way that they should be. Is, yeah. OK, IT, yeah. Um, as developers, we've got different tools that we use. And I spent a lot of time helping people understand what tools are available and what you can do with it. Um, tools like Visual Studio, I, I spent a lot, a lot of time around that. But VS Code has got a lot of great capabilities, too. And so this talk, this afternoon, 
This morning we created a application and it looks sort of like this. Infrastructure as code, we had an idea. I'll, I'll show the joke for just a second because it's actually kind of funny. Um, when you think about how you're going to spend a lot of time trying to get something to work, it's providing that value of being repeatable. It's actually important. But the idea of having an application, we built out this morning a dad app. And we created it, put it out there. And it's, it's a nice application. It's got DevOps. It's got a little bit of infrastructure as code. We did some governance. We you know, played around with our users, uh, RBAC, and other things, tagging. Um, I really want to talk in this talk deeper about how do we fix some of the issues that we've got with what we created this morning. Things like names, things like tags. And then how can we do that consistently? And then the different tools that are available for uh, making that work. Um, questions when you're thinking about infrastructure as code is like, what, how do I pick the right tools that's going to fit and make the most sense for the long-term ownership of a given, uh, given you know, technology decision? How, you know, what's the learning curve? What is my reliability? You know, the readability of the language, the tooling that's available. A lot of this stuff has evolved over the years and has gotten a lot better. Um, within Azure, we've got a lot of different deployment options. We can use the uh, portal to deploy stuff. You can use PowerShell, the CLI. I can go out and create stuff very quickly um, using ARM templates and Bicep, but I can also use Terraform. I can use uh, Pulumi. I can use Ansible. I can use Chef. Um, there's a lot of different tools that are available to go out and create uh, infrastructure as code. Um, infrastructure as code is nice because it's versioned. I'm able to manage it. I'm able to add it to a pipeline, be able to get a consistent output. Um, it's descriptive of what I want that endpoint to look like as opposed to procedural. Um, depending on how I use the tool, I can take care of something where I've got a certain kind of configuration that I expect to have. I can catch it and be able to pull it back and be able to you know, see if I can't make it um, fit what it should be, a, a, a avoid that environmental drift. So let's, for this talk, I wanted to kind of go through and take a look at the infrastructure that we had created before. And that was with our project in Visual Studio, we created and deployed some code out here. The code is in our uh, repo. If you go out to, if you want to get to the Copenhagen, go to Benko Tips slash CPH23. This is our code from this morning. Um, I've got a, uh, some, some links to different things. But for infrastructure as code, let's dive into you know, what we ended up creating. And if you look at our resource group, you'll see we've got a plan. We've got a couple of different plans we created because we did it a couple different times. We have apps, we have names for servers that don't necessarily make sense. We've got a uh, SQL server with a GUID attached to it, uh, App Insights. Names are so-so, tags are so-so. I really want to be able to create something that's going to have a, a way that I can find things, do a better job with my governance. And if you are um, looking at the uh, Azure portal, there's a resource visualizer that shows how these things are related. That's kind of a nice feature of the portal that is kind of newer. Um, I can go to deployments, and I can see the history of how I got to where I am. So I've got my deployments, which is actually kind of nice. With ARM and uh, Bicep, I can go out and I can go and even pull up one of those deployment templates and go out and see what that template looked like by going into uh, the deployment history. Um, kind of a nice feature. But that ARM template that we created is not the most readable thing. If I look at the code that got created, and I'm going to use uh, Visual Studio or VS Code for this. Um, is this. Is this readable? Is that big enough? And the black on light, it's like I'm doing infrastructure as code, but I'm a younger developer now. So. With that in mind, you know, I can go out and I can see what my JSON looks like. I can get through this. In here, there's also an outline. So if I click on the outline, there's actually an ARM template outliner 
in VS Code that I've got turned on for this. Um, the way I got to this was I went to my extensions. I installed the Azure tools, which included my ARM uh, template um, tools. So the Azure Resource Manager extension gives me the ability to uh, go out and see all of that stuff. So what I want to do is take this, but make it into something that's a little bit easier to understand. And the trouble I've got is that when I'm going through and creating an ARM template, I end up with just a lot of noise. It's, it's JSON. It's not super easy to read. What I'd like to do is to create it this, but do it from kind of a, a starting point where I'm just going to start from scratch. So let's go up here. And in this, we'll take that and delete it. Yes. I'm going to create a new file inside of ARM. And we'll call this my site.json. And within uh, VS Code, I can use a couple of different code snippets to make this thing go easier. And is that, is that fully readable? I think we said it was, right? So in here, a lot of times when I'm going out and creating infrastructure as code, I want to be able to have parameters that make sense. Having a, a hosting plan name doesn't always make sense to me, right? But I do have an app name. I might have an environment name. I might have some other parameters that I want to work with. So I usually will go out and I'll say, OK, well, here's a new parameter. If you tab in, you can say, here's the, I'm going to call this my app name. It is a type string, and then I have a description. And if I come down, I can do more of that. I can also do this um, with a simpler format, just on one line. I can call this my environment name. But it's all on one line. It's a little bit easier to read. And I tend to find that readability makes a big difference in how I go out and write code. Um, so like, for instance, I might have my environment name, and I might have my um, color that I'm going to pass in as another Thing. If I want to have a default on this, I could say comma default value, give it a value of, say, light, green, light yellow, or whatever. Um, but my parameters are, are part of it. Where I get the real value in like, naming things is having variables that will do those name calculations for me. And so in my variables, I'll I, I will usually have something that's going to be something like, a site name. And the site name, I could say, is going to be, we'll go out and concatenate. And we're going to concatenate the uh, parameters for the uh, app name, put a dash in it, and then do another parameters for my um, environment name. And then I would do another thing where I'd say tick dash site. And I could use this then to go through and create my host name, my site name, my AI name, basically including the different parts of the name. Um, since I'm going to reuse the parameters for app name and environment name, I'm going to call this prefix. And I'm going to take this part here off. And let's put this in here, where I go, my uh, site name is going to be concatenate. And I'm going to concatenate my variable of my prefix with a dash site. And we'll do the same thing for the host. And that's basically going through and taking advantage of some of the string functions I've got inside of ARM to be able to do that. So using my prefix and then the host. One of the things I like about uh, VS Code is I get a lot of int IntelliSense showing me that here's a variable I haven't used, but that's one that I have. And so I get a, a real quick uh, visual ID idea of what's being used and what's not. And if I've got a syntax error, it'll, it'll give me the red. And so I can, I can find those things really quick. Um, once we have some variables, usually you'll go out and create some resources. Um, I've got a resource. Uh, snippet I put in here for a, a Linux um, hosting plan where I've got the host name is going to be that variable that we created for the host name. 
and it's going to basically pull in the different components that I need for this to be a valid, uh, a valid resource, because it's got the type on there, it's got the version, API version is an important part. Um, you got your resource groups and stuff like that. Um, coming down here, we can add another resource for my Linux site. Um, let me do that again. And for this, I'm going to pull in the variables for my site name. And then I'm going to come over here and in my host name, I actually need to get rid of the ticks and just use my variables for the host name. And the nice thing about that is that inside of VS Code, I've got the multi-editor, so it places the editor in all those different parts of the thing, which I, as a tooling guy, I'm like, I love editors that work. They make it easy for me to go out and add stuff in right where I need it. Um, I can come over here, and I can in my resources, I can add some config. So my app config then is going to be tied to the variable of my site name. And then down here, I've got the values, env name, which we're going to say arm, and then my uh, favorite color, which we'll pull in from the parameters of the color. And if I did this right, and I look at all of this, now I've got a template that is um, on the far left side, you can see kind of like a highlight if you have like misspellings or errors or whatever. But I've basically been able to go out and create a template that is going to create a website hosting plan and some configuration values for it. I can save this and then test it by going into going into the um, PowerShell. And if I do a control period and Clear this out, CLS. I'm sitting here, and I can go out, and I can do an AZ login. So I've already done that. I can do an AZ account set, my subscription to where I'm running this stuff. I've got a couple of variables I tend to use. Uh, we're using CPH23. And I'm going to create a resource group that is going to be named, um, that it will be named, let's go up here, do a Control Z, and then do an F8. Um, CPH23 ARM resource group. Uh, to do a deployment of an ARM template, uh, the, the resource group actually needs to be created. So I can do an AZ group create to create the resource group. Um, I'll do this into the central US. And down below, I know it's kind of noisy seeing all this stuff here. But I get a response back saying that I go ahead and it went ahead and created that. Um, and then I can come down and I can say, OK, I'm going to run this and do my AZ group create with the resource group, passing in where the template file lives, and then some parameters. And doing that, I can say, go out, check this out. It says on the left-hand side, I've got an, a parameter I'm passing in, the app name, but I didn't pass in the environment because you know, I might want to do that differently. Um, so down here, I can say the environment name is arm. And what it does is it takes that ARM template now and goes out, sends it off to Azure, the resource manager, does a uh, check to make sure that the uh, template is valid. And then down here, you can see it's running. And when it gets done, then we'll be able to go into Azure and be able to see exactly what got created. Questions about ARM? Say that it, it, So the question is, I think, is it item potent? And like Terraform is item potent, where I basically it'll go out and identify what isn't there and then make any changes. Yes, it is. And that's and what we're doing is we're describing the shape of what we want this to look like when we get done. Any other questions? So assuming that this thing is going to run, and it runs successfully, um, I can watch it do the deployment by going into my uh, CPH deployments, go to my resource groups, do a search here for CPH. For Copenhagen, there's the ARM resource group. Click on the deployments. 
and I can actually see this deployment ran, and it should have succeeded. And there's my deployment details. If I come back up here and I look at the overview, there it's created my site with the right name, with the host and the site. And then I can go ahead and deploy my code or the application in, and run it there. ARM is great. It's got, it is a 100% uh, up to date because it is the language of Azure. Uh, when I go out to the resources.azure.com, you'll find that in here, if I were to browse out to resources.azure.com, see if this actually works. Oh, look at this, sign in. This takes me to where I can see the actual resource preview. This then goes out, shows me my subscriptions. From my subscriptions, I can go into the different components of it. And the way that ARM actually stores it is as, um, as the JSON uh, format. So if I go to the CPH23 resource group and I look at the resources, this is, a, this is what it stores it and what it looks like inside of Azure, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, an interesting fact about this is that I'm doing gets, but I can also do put. I can do actions as well. Um, not that we will, but um, the idea of an ARM template is that there's a set structure of things that it contains. Uh, the content version, there's a schema, there's some parameters, variables, resources, and outputs. In a DevOps pipeline, I might want to be able to pull out the uh, site name, because I might use that for DNS. I might use that for how do I you know, do another part of, of, the, of the flow of things. Um, the resource section has got usually the name, the type, and then some optional additional data that describes how that resource should work, um, including tags and you know, SKUs and things like that. Each resource can be unique, but it's got a schema version that's attached to it. Um, to work with ARM, we've got Visual Studio, the resource group project that we did earlier this morning. Um, VS Code's got the ARM extension. You can, when you create something inside of the Azure portal, it actually creates an ARM template and does that deployment. Um, you can use uh, other tools to be able to uh, put stuff out there. Um, it is native, which is nice, but it's also a little bit verbose, and there's a lot of noise in it. It's not the most readable thing. Um, and for that reason, uh, Microsoft created a project called Bicep. Bicep moves the arm. It animates the arm. It's a, it's a language transpiler, which means that it takes a language and it creates something that is ARM as the output. So when I use Bicep, I create something that will turn into ARM when I run it um, as a transpiler. Um, it's a lot simpler syntax. Uh, it came out well after Terraform, and you could, you could say that Bicep is very similar to uh, Terraform's syntax. Um, in that it, it minimizes the number of inputs. It's a lot cleaner. It's easier to read. Um, some may say it's easier to use. Um, nice thing about uh, Bicep and ARM is there's no state file that I have to worry about, um, and there's no cost. It's, it's open source, um, supports everything. Um, a bice getting started with Bicep, if I have an ARM template, is actually very, very easy. So if I'm looking at my files here, and I say az bicep decompile, I can pass in the file of infra slash arm slash my site dot json, and it will then do its best effort to take that arm file and decompile it into a bicep file. So this file that was json arm looks like this in Bicep. And so I've got decorators, like the description for the app name. I've got parameters equals light yellow. I've got the prefix where I've got doing some string interpolation. Um, I've got the resources, which have got some basic values that are coming in, um, the settings and everything else. Um, I can take a template out of the portal, save it, and do a, a decompile. It'll do its best efforts. If there's errors, um, there are times where you need to update your Bicep version. But it works really, really well to get started with Bicep if, from, from, a, from an existing infrastructure. Um, of course, 
uh, creating and using Bicep doesn't mean you have to have ARM to start with that you turn into Bicep to work with. You can also just start with an empty file. So for instance, I can go out and create a new file. We'll call this main.bicep. And in Bicep, I've got this thing called a target scope. Target scope is sort of like in Terraform, I can create a deployment that will be at the subscription level to go out and create that resource group. When I was doing the ARM, I had to create the resource group to say where I'm going to send stuff to. With Bicep, I can create that uh, by just targeting the subscription level and then saying, hey, I've got a resource that's going to be RG, which is going to be a resource group. And the IntelliSense is pretty good, too. When I pick this out, it also gives me my schema version. Now, I want to point out schema version because this is something that uh, ARM and Bicep do really well. In Terraform, it's a little bit different on how you can figure out which schema you're targeting. Uh, Pulumi is, is, is another one where I'm not exactly sure how I'm able to target the right exact thing. But when I do this, I can say equals, and then I get the required properties, which gives me a name and a location. So for my name, I actually should probably have a parameter up here. Let's create a parameter. We'll call this my app name. And it's a string. We'll make you pass that in. We're going to have a parameter for my environment name, string. And we're going to say this is equal to bicep. And then we have another parameter for color, string. And we'll have a default value of blue. And uh, Copilot is offering all kinds of nice, helpful suggestions as I go through this. Um, but let's create a variable to create my RG name. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this equal to the environment name dash, or my app name dash environment name dash RG. So I can put this down here and say RG name. And it will then use my variable. And it's basically using the syntax of curly brace with a dollar sign on the outside of it. Inside Terraform, it's a little bit different. I say var dot something or local dot whatever. Um, this makes it easy for me to go out and create additional things that are going to use that. Uh, we can put a, a location on here. Maybe we got a location param loc string is equal to, say, central US. I'll create this back in Chanhassen, where I'm from, say loc. Um, and, and I could go ahead and I could create all of my resources, go out and pull in all kinds of different things. It's 100% up to date all the time. One of the things that you do with, when you work with infrastructure in, as code is modules and being able to import and use other things. Um, Bicep does a really good job of that by making it easy to go ahead and say, here's a module for my site. And it's going to actually, it looks at the directory and says, well, what are the files that I know about? And I can path to that. It's kind of interesting. So I can go to my site, Bicep. Again, I can say equals and use the required properties. And it says, here's my target scope. Well, that's going to be my resource group. I'm going to go to the name. We'll call this just site. And my app name will be app name. And my environment name will be environment name. If I go back over into my site.bicep and I say, well, I uh, have a parameter that doesn't have a default, I could pass that in and then be able to pull that. And then the IntelliSense on the main.bicep would automatically pull that up and be able to pull it through. But the tooling on this is really nice for being able to have modular kinds of things where I'm reusing templates in lots of different places. Um, saving it, going out and saying, OK, well, let's do a deployment on this. Um, what I can do is I can say AZ, by, or AZ deploy, and I can do a deployment to the subscription level and I'm going to create a location. Uh, and it's going to use the template file being that uh, bicep file. So if we come to this, do an F8, I can run this from inside of this. And so it's going out, checking to see that, the, um, that everything's going to work. I can say, yeah, here's my app name. We're going to call this CPH23. Uh, my environment name for this is bicep. I had a default on that. And what it's doing is it's taking that bicep file and turning it into ARM and then doing that deployment. 
And again, now it's going out, starting and running. And what we should end up with inside of Azure, again, coming back over here to our portal, going back to resource groups, doing a refresh, searching for CPH. There's my CPH bicep resource group right here. If I open that up, I can see here's a deployment that's going, and there's the site that's, that's being deployed into that. And when that's done, then I can see that my infrastructure as a bicep works very similarly. Again, one of the key things about this that is different from Terraform and Pulumi and other things is that I do get the actual templates that I can see in the deployment inside the Azure portal. So the, site inf or the state information is all part of that. Um, coming over here, the target, the way the bicep file works is you have a target scope, you have parameters that have some decorators that you can put on them for default values, allowed values. Um, I've got a variable section, I can add resources, modules, and outputs. Uh, parameters, you can use lengths, allowed values, description. Um, you get some uh, different types of variables. Resources, it's nice because it's pulling back that schema version. Otherwise, you're going out and looking a lot of that stuff up. Um, but you can get started with it very quickly by decompiling an existing template. And then the code extension inside of uh, the Azure set of tools in VS Code, it makes it really nice for uh, working with Bicep. Questions on the ARM and Bicep part of the talk? Yeah. Okay. So a good point. So um, in your scenario, I've got a resource group in a named resource group, and I want to change the name of that resource group, or, or I want to move the. I want to. I've, it's kept inside of ARM. So where I showed you resources.azure.com, that's the state information. That's, that's the, and, and it uses that to know what's there. And anything that I add to the template that's different, it's going to be able to compare against the existing database and then add or change or move stuff as needed. So, so, so when, I when I do a deployment, I'm not running it locally. I'm, I'm running against the ARM engine of Azure. And, and the ARM engine is actually executing and going to the rest endpoints of all of those resources and creating and doing things. But it's feeding it through, through ARM. If I... It, it, so if I create a copy of this and change the name of it, it would create another resource group with whatever those things are. Um, when you're using ARM and, and Bicep, I can do a deployment that's incremental, which will add but not destroy. Or I can do, um, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like where it's going to look exactly like this. And if there's something that shouldn't be there, it'll remove the extra stuff. But there is a way to do that. Is what? Mode complete. That's it. Yep. Can I do a plan? Yes. Great question. In Terraform, I can say, you know, plan, and it shows me all the things that would come up and change. In ARM and Bicep, I have a what if, which I can add to the AZ command, which will then return back the things that will be different. Good question. Anything else? So uh, the question is, is in Terraform, you've got this, the, the lock file, which says that multiple people can't be hitting things at the same time. 
the state is not on my local machine or separate from Azure. It's in Azure. So if I run multiple, uh, multiple templates at the same time, they will run concurrently, and it's the order that they were started that it will layer on top of things. I believe there are some blocking operations. I'm not sure about that, but that's um, when, when if, I, if you're if you've got a template and I've got a template, we're both deploying to the same resource group. It should probably be additive, but it'll overlay. It first come gets laid down, and the next one would overlay whatever's there. Right. Yeah. Good questions. So how do I work with something that's already existing inside of ARM and BICEP where I, in Terraform I would have to import those things? Yep. Right. In, in the next section where I talk about Terraform, there's a data resource where I can refer to an existing thing and be able to say, OK, well, that's here already, so use that. I don't need to inside of ARM BICEP because it's using that ARM database of what's there. So I don't have to import anything in because it, it's using that already. If I'm referring to something that's not there, if it doesn't exist, it'll, it'll, it'll fail when it tries to re, uh, connect to it. But uh, the way that, um, right, like subnets, yeah. Um, with ARM and BICEP, I don't really have to worry about that as much because, but the, you know, the, the thing about ARM and BICEP is it is an Azure-only thing. And it is using Azure's native store for the state information. And because it's doing that, where in other tools I have to you know, tell it, go out and find out what's in that, that store and import it and, and work back and forth. With ARM and BICEP, I'm kind of isolated from that a little bit. Um, so I would have, um, Usually, for an ARM set of things, I'll, I'll lay down like networks and shared key vaults and resource groups and shared things, and I'll do that at one le level, and then I'll lay down another set of ARM templates to give a, a given workload uh, what they need. Moving on. Just showing what we got created here in our BICEP resource group. We've got the two things. We've got our deployments that ran that shows that here's what got deployed. OK, one more question. Yeah, so sure. Can you maybe show that you, if you want to change, you know, in Central US, right? Right. It would not. So if, like, switching a location of a resource, it would need to destroy it from where it is and recreate it. But it would show those steps of going through and doing that. Yeah. Moving, moving on to Terraform. Terraform is another uh, infrastructure as code tool. A lot of people are used for creating uh, infrastructure. How many people work with Terraform today? A few. Um, how many people work with ARM or BICEP? Uh, also, a few. How about Pulumi? A few, OK, but not a lot. Um, how about Ansible or other Chef, PowerShell? There's a lot of different ways you can go out and create infrastructure. Um, Terraform is a very popular one. And it's popular because it's cross-cloud. It's cross, not just cloud, it's cross different things, like New Relic. I can use Terraform to go out and create what's called an ephemeral, a test case inside a new relic and be able to put it out there. I can use Terraform to go out and create a data dog, uh, something to go out and monitor and pull information back, and I can do that in Terraform. Um, I go out and I use a provider, I pull it in, I say what I want to do with it, and then I can work with it. Yeah. There's a lot of providers. 
And if there's not a provider, you can write your own providers. Um, we were doing it with InfoBlox for uh, different purposes. Um, I like Terraform a lot. Uh, the HCL language is very similar to Bicep, or you could say Bicep is similar to Terraform. I don't know which way it, eh, I, I don't know which way it goes, but if you are f happy with how it looks in one, you could probably read the other. Um, it is multi-cloud. It's a tool for versioning infrastructure. Um, the way it, you, uh, it works is it's a single executable that is a text file processor. You get it into your path, and then you can run Terraform, and then you do initialize, plan, apply, and destroy. Um, it's got one of my very favorite um, uh, messages that come back. It's called still destroying, still destroying, still destroying. And, and I want to get a t-shirt that says still destroying, um, just because it's, it's fun to go out and do that. Um, I use Chaco to install it on this machine, so Chaco install Terraform will go out and add it to uh, your machine. But it's organized around a workspace. Um, and there are, there's a couple different versions of Terraform, to be, to be fair. There's the paid for version, which is Terraform Cloud, and then there's the open source free version. If you're doing the free version, which is what I've used almost every place I've been, um, you are responsible for the state file, but also for how it works and how you set up your environments and things like that. Um, it views a folder as the workspace, and inside that folder, I can put Terraform files, TF files that have my different sets of things that I want to do. And when I go out to compile it, it uses that folder, creates a subfolder that has all of the modules that I might be including into it. And then it goes through, and then referencing a state file that I point to somewhere, um, it'll then go through and figure out what it needs to do to uh, update your, Azure, your infrastructure and wherever you are. One of the things about that state file is it is, um, it's a JSON file, is it JSON? And it is plain text, which is great because then you can go out and you can read it and you can see exactly what's in there. It uses that to be able to you know, compare against like the password. So if you change the password, you can see what the old password was and what the new password would be. Yeah. Um, did you hear that? SQL Server. It's SA password, plain text, state file. That's awesome. <laughs> it's you got to be thinking about it, but if you're th if you think about it and you're careful with it, okay. It, it, I guess it makes sense, um, but it's something that you need to be thinking about. Um, we use Terraform a lot, and we keep our, uh, our Terraform state file in a blob storage up in Azure that is secured, locked down, so uh, only the service principal can get to it. Um, if you have to have a break class, you can do that to get to it, but you try to make it hard. Again, um, but you basically go out, you define what providers you're going to use. You go through, you set up some variables. Uh, you can use uh, variables to set up things. You can have default values. Um, you can create resources. And you can also uh, use data to be able to pull in an existing uh, resource. Um, the commands I use to work with it are init, um, initializes the environment. Plan goes out and says, OK, well, this is what it should look like. I can do an apply, runs the template, destroy, deletes it. There's also TF state. I can import and work with the state like you were talking about. So if my, my state file des describes what Azure should have, and if it's not there, or if Azure has something that's not in my state file, Terraform will have an issue. And you have to uh, work with uh, fixing those kinds of things. Um, an example of coding with it because this is a coding session. We're going out and building code here. I'm going to create a Terraform folder. And in here, I'm going to create a file. We'll call it main.tf. And I'm going to minimize this. And in here, you'll see I'm going to create a very simple template that matches out to what we did before. So in my Terraform, I'm going to have my provider, which I'm going to pull in. And I recognize I'm using version two or higher, which is a little bit old. But I'm using a data to go out and get my uh, client configuration. Now, once I do this, I can go out and I can create a resource group. Resource, my TF resource. 
where I'm going to pull in and create a resource group with a given name. RG name um, should probably create a variable to actually define that. Uh, so again, I have a variable where I can say, here's my variable name, app name. And I actually don't, I, I can do this, but to make it a little bit more readable, I like to do this, and I do my var variable for my e, e and v name. And then I have a section that I usually like to work with called locals. In my locals, I'll go out and I'll calculate out the resource group name. Resource group name will be the app name dash whatever. In this case, I'm using the var to be the variable dot whatever as opposed to just the curly brace with the, the parameter. Um, so there's a little bit of, of nuance on that. Um, I probably have also a variable for my site name. which would be like that, and my host name, which would look like that. Um, I really like how uh, GitHub Copilot is suggesting code for me, because it makes my typing go really fast. Um, hopefully, you have the same kind of a response when you go through and do this. Um, but then I can go through and I can say, well, here's my, um, my Terraform uh, plan which then is going to come down, here's, here's my plan name. We're going to use my local dot uh, host name. It's going to create a Linux resource with the uh, location name and using an S1. And then I can do my Terraform uh, site, which is going to be, again, similar. We're going to come down to this and use local dot site name. And then I've got my key and values, E and V name. And we'll put to this, we'll say that is uh, Terraform and my favorite color. And I think th their color is like a purplish, right? Eh, maybe a dark purple. Let's see. And which one? environment name, E-N-V. There we go. Yeah, otherwise, it wouldn't find my environment name when I deployed my code there. But as you can see, um, Terraform looks a lot like Bicep. There's not a, if you can read one, you can probably read the other. Um, but let's save this, and then let's go out, and we're going to open up our window here. And I'm going to go CD infra slash Terraform, and I'm going to say, Terraform in it. The what? Terraform format. Yeah, I, I, the format then changes everything around, and it's like makes it look nice. I should do that. Yeah. When I did this, notice it added a folder here and a file, terraform.lock and terraform folder in my git ignore. I don't like to check those things in, so I do star.terraform, and I also do star.terraform.lock star. So I don't want to check in the lock file either. Yeah, did I do that right? There, now that's gone gray. Um, when I do a terraform, I could do a plan and send my output to a plan file. Um, or I could just do an apply. And if I do an apply, what it'll do is it's going to do a plan and then ask me if I want to apply it. Or I could do a Terraform apply with just the plan that came out of the plan command. Um, the Terraform plan itself is a binary file. So if you expect to view that plan file, you need to do a Terraform show or plan show, which then will convert that into the text so that like in your DevOps process, you might have a check to say, hey, someone needs to look at the plan and make sure that what we're putting out there isn't going to break something. I'll put in my app name, CPH23. My environment is Terraform. I can also use TF var files to specify the values for uh, variables when I'm going into this. Um, but it's going to go through, and it's creating the Terraform state file here. If you look at that, that tf state file is going to be what the state looks like. 
Um, usually, I will have that state file pointed to uh, some online other secure storage rather than my local machine. Um, but for demo purposes, I just wanted to show what this looks like. Um, it'll go through, figure out what it needs to do. And when it gets done, then it says, here's what we're going to create. We're going to create a resource group. We're going to create a site config. We've got logs, connection string, all of the pieces that it needs to know about for making this environment work. It's a lot more detail than what I put into it, but there's a lot of defaults that come with that. So if I type in yes, it's going to go ahead and then create whatever's there. And this then goes through and does that actual um, creation. And it'll give some log messages that it's working. Questions on Terraform? Actually, it's not. No, Terraf Bicep does that. What Terraform's doing is it's talking to the REST endpoints of these Azure services, and it's using the provider to go out and find the actual RESTful interaction that it needs to do. But Terraform itself is animating all of that. Good question. Other questions? So it's creating, still creating, still creating. Um, interesting thing about this is when it gets done is if I come over to the portal and I go back to my resource groups and I say, show me all the resource groups that are here, it'll eventually come back and say, yes, this stuff exists. So it should have created. the resource group. And trust me, it actually does work. Oh. Did I not name that the right thing? I did, I did use CPH, didn't I? OK. OK. CPH. It should be there. CPH. RG name. OK. Ah, that's it. Right. I should have used this and then gone local.resource group name. Good, good catch. If I had a t shirt, I would give it to you. But um, in the interest of time, if I pull up in here for resource group, and it was RG name, search for name, there it is, RG name, um, and I look at my deployments, there's no history here. And that's the thing that I'm now depending on, keeping track of how, what deployment did I run that did this. So this is where we like to inject tags that have a commit ID that um, can be the hash of a commit so that I know which version of source code actually created that stuff. Um, that we do in DevOps. One of the challenges with, uh, with Terraform is trying to get uh, different environments and being able to work with that from um, from a given folder, because if I have test QA and prod, I have to have different copies of the code unless I'm doing it um, in a way to manage that state. Um, one other tool for working with infrastructure as code is Pulumi. If I CD here up and I make dir
So um, there's a, a number of different, so the, the point you're making about having different strategies for working with different environments, um, I've seen that some, some organizations will do like different folders and they will create a base folder and pull in from mod other modules and other repos where those um, templates actually live and then have the variable file flow through on how it connects everything. Um, you can also do it in DevOps. We do where we just clear out everything, we pass in what we want, it recreates everything um, every time for us anyway. Um, but that's a, that's a real good point. Um, to get to the Pulumi piece, though, because there was some, a, a question about how do we do Pulumi. Uh, Pulumi is a developer, it's a, it's a .NET, it's a uh, native way to go out and create code to go out and do your infrastructure. And um, it's a cross-platform. Um, Pulumi, I can go out and I use the uh, Pulumi application, which I've installed from uh, Pulumi. Dot com um, and download the tools. When I've done that, I can go Pulumi new, and I'm going to do an Azure uh, C Sharp Pulumi project, which then goes out. It'll ask me some questions about how I want this to work. Um, CD Pulumi and then go Plumi new uh, Azure C Sharp. Um, if I don't do the type of template I want, it will prompt me for a whole list of different things. And it's on the command line, and it's a little bit kludgy to, to go up and down and find it. So what I do for this demo is to go through and do that. But we'll create one for CPH 23. And I'm going to give it a description, CPH demos. And I'm going to give this a stack name. We're going to call this demo. And so it's going to create a stack for me, and I can target, say, West Europe, which will go out and install the different dependencies it needs. Um, and since I'm doing C Sharp, which happens to be the language that I tend to be most familiar with, um, you'll find that I've got over here the uh, program CS. I've got some YAML that describes where this is going to run, and I've got a CS project. And inside of the uh, this file, by default, it gives me a resource group, um, a storage account, and then some other uh, pieces of information. Uh, the way I've used and seen it used is that with Pulumi, I can create a stack. We'll call it my stack.cs. And inside of this, um, I would have something that goes out and using my naming standards and just standard language features. Like in C Sharp, it would be variables where I'm passing in, doing some string interpolation on app name, getting my resource group, my plan name, and site. I go out and I create a class that has uh, a new app service plan that has some uh, constructors in it for the resource group name, the kind, the SKU. Um, I've got some variables for going out to create the uh, actual uh, project that looks like that. And then in my program, what I would do is instead of doing this is I'd run a sync with my stack, um, basically go out and say, create an instance of this class. And that class then describes what that infrastructure would be. And if I did this correctly, and I go Pulumi up, it'll go out and compile and check to see that my uh, Pulumi code matches out to what it should be. So how does it keep track of like the state information and things like that? So uh, I think what you're asking is the like in, in ARM I could specify use this schema version of the API endpoints. Mm -hmm. So I don't know of how to dive into that because I haven't done enough with Pulumi. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a good answer on that. Sorry about that. Right.
Okay. Okay. So what, what I think you said is that there, there's a way that you can import the specific things you would use for that version of the API. And there's b pieces of code that you would end up adding to it. For those that are on the stream or whatever that they couldn't hear that, I just want to make sure I repeated that. Um, so Pulumi will go out and give me the, uh, the what if. If I were to scroll up and take a look, it says it's going to create four things. It's running this from the Pulumi server. So if I go out and I click on this link, it'll open up inside of the Pulumi cloud where it's connecting up using my credentials to get to my cloud and do uh, the deployment of things for me. Um, I can come back over here and say, do I want to do this? And say, yes, let's go ahead and do that. So now it's going to go out and do that deployment for me. And like Terraform, I won't have a deployment inside of the list of deployments inside the Azure portal. But if I look at the resources.azure, it's all stored inside of ARM. So it's still activating those REST endpoints that make Azure work, but it's doing it uh, through the other way. And it appears we're getting close to time on this. Um, I haven't worked with Pulumi enough to be able to give you a real good feel for, um, for where it fits. In my head, I think there's a, a good use case for when I'm selling something where I want to be able to go out and do some provisioning. If I'm doing infrastructure as code for <coughs> internal infrastructure for an, an environment, I tend to want to check that code in and be able to see all the changes and use the uh, code management for it. Um, this, it, it, it's, it feels a little bit different. I'm not quite sure how that fits. Ansible's another one um, that people will use. Um, but no matter what tool you use, you, you need to look at the tooling around it. You know, what, what are the considerations? You know, the, the, how, how current is it? Are we, you know, how are we working with modules? How are we doing looping? How are we doing security? Um, a quick comparison between the different tools. Um, I, I include this in the slides, but it's like you've got just kind of the different ways that you're looking at. If you're doing a uh, infrastructure that is primarily or solely based in Azure, ARM and BICEP is a really good choice because I don't have to worry about the state file. As soon as I'm starting to do things outside of that, Terraform makes a lot of sense, or Pulumi or, or something that's cross-platform because that might become a priority. So it really comes back to, you know, I'm a consultant. This is why we make the big money, because we can say, it depends. And then we try to learn how to ask better questions. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, it was meant as a kind of a flyover, as opposed to a super deep dive. Um, I did ask ChatGPT, which is the best one. And as, you know, as a chat engine, it's, uh, you know, OK, whatever. It's, not really giving an answer. But the best part is now you've got a skill. So we can go out and say, yes, we're infrastructure as code developers. Um, I like Terraform. I use, I use what my clients ask me to use. I mean, ultimately, it comes back to um, helping them understand the trade-offs when you go one path versus another. Um, coming from Microsoft, I, I tend to be very close to the ARM and the, you know, the native, you know, native things, but there are better ways to do that. Um, and I just encourage you to go out and, and have some fun with that. So that was it. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, let me get a, can I get a picture of you guys with me? Like, here, I'm going to turn around and, and we're going to be like, there we go. All of us. Yay. Okay, act like you, you like, act like you enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And enjoy the week.